Um, hello and welcome. Uh, my name is uh, David Knight. I'm the editor in chief and co founder of uh, Silicon Alley, which is based here in Berlin. Uh, it's an English language uh, tech news site and community. So uh, please check it out. But uh, I will be hosting today. Uh, we have six very, very interesting lightning talks, five minute talks, followed by a brief bit of QA. Um, some very interesting topics as well. So I hope you enjoy it. Uh, first up, we have Annette Gliesel Maslov, who's going to be talking to us uh, about augmented reality. So uh, please step up and uh, I'll let you do your talk and then we'll have a chat. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? It's very strange to talk and <laughs> to have their own headphones on. <laughs> so, hey. Uh, as introduced, I'm Annette Gliesel Maslow from Metayo. We're doing augmented reality and I'm the PR and social media manager there. And as far as I don't have a lot of time, we right start and I tell you a bit about our company. Um, oh, that was one slide too much. Okay. Uh, Mattia was founded in 2003 in Munich. Our headquarters are in Munich. We are more than 120 employees, or around 120 employees, 20 employee employees, and we have offices in San Francisco, Dallas, and New York already. And we are spreading out the augmented reality world everywhere in the world. And more than 85,000 developers are already working with our software. Uh, which is quite impressive for us, but there are much more people using augmented reality and I'm quite sure that a lot of people know what is augmented reality in this audience, but usually people don't know, are not familiar with the term augmented reality. So, uh, we teamed up with more than 1,000 uh, companies um, that they can have very cool and great AR experiences for their companies. And I want to show you a very short video which shows our showreel and shows some projects we did in 2013. Does any one of you know one of these projects shown in the showreel? Like the IKEA catalog application, for example? Did you try it? Okay, if you didn't try all one of these, come to our booth in the main entrance hall after the talk and we will show you all of this.
Um, yeah, what is our uh, model, our business model? Uh, I think around 70% are the, is the software license um, business. So we are selling software for developers and non-developers who want to create AR experiences by themselves. Uh, we have the Metaio Creator, which you can, with that you can easily create AR experiences via drag and drop. And we can also give you a short introduction in uh, next to our booth. We brought it with us, and if you want to do AR experiences yourself, just come over. Uh, with the Metaio SDK, you can create uh, easily uh, your own applications for AR. And we have a lot of more um, products. And if you want to have an overview, you can also come to our booth. Uh, yesterday, we released together with Epson uh, the new Movario BT200, which is, which is one of the new variables, the new classes, the data classes. And we released the first real see-through AR experiences, so which is ready with our SDK for developers who want to create AR experiences on variables like Google Glass or the apps Movario, and also come over and try them. Uh, we, we brought them with, uh, with us, and we want to show them to you. Um, yeah, and I think my time is already gone. So if you're interested, visit our website, uh, visit our social media channels, or as I said more than once, <laughs> just come over to our booth. We, are, we would be happy to welcome you there. Thank you. Wait, 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 wait. Come back, come back. <laughs> come back. The Q&A. I forgot the Q&A. <laughs> the, <Q &A. laughs> the most important part. Well, thank you uh, very much, Annette, for that. Um, so tell me, are wearables the future of AR? Is this really Definitely. The, yeah. Definitely we are the future. What I'm sort of sure. potential does AR hold for Google Glasses and the like? The great thing is that you can experience your real world and you can get a virtual information overlaid. Uh, so it means you can walk through a city uh, and on the wearables you can see further information like navigation or like historic effects to some buildings or anything else what, which you are interested in. Because for me, the, the, the problem um, with, with AR a, a little bit is, is you're meant to use it a lot on the go. We, we saw in the video people in supermarkets and so on and so forth. And I think a lot of people are slightly unhappy to be sort of spend their life walking exactly. around like this. Exactly. Which, uh, which, which I guess uh, things like Google Glass would, would solve the problem. Exactly. Um, okay, so what's next in AR? What's the next big step? What's, what's the next sort of thing that's going to blow these people's minds? In our story, you saw the videos for the Volkswagen Marta case, for example, and you also saw the Audi Ecots info application. Which, these are both uh, service and maintenance applications, and we also created for the Epson Movario with Mitsubishi together a maintenance application for the Epson classes, where the technician sees directly the instru instructions uh, step by step on the wearables. And I think these are very important things. So if you <laughs> If you imagine you have, you buy some furniture from IKEA and you have no idea how to assemble them, uh, and you have the wearables and you get step by step instructions without reading all these very crappy uh, manuals, <laughs> but you get the instructions right on your screen, uh, right on the wearables, on the glasses, this would be perfect, I think, and we think this is very interesting. You're allowed to say crappy, don't worry. Um, <laughs> so, is this? I mean, is this the alternative to? Uh, holograms, which I think for a long time people thought, yeah, we're going to have holograms that kind of pop up and show us how to do that kind of stuff. I mean, is this really where we're going to be with everyone wearing glasses, which, you know, you're not sure about something, poof, there it goes. Exactly. Do you think everyone's going to have uh, AR glasses in the next few I think years? the mixture of virtual reality and uh, augmented reality is the future. So we want to create just virtual information for all the people and we want to mix all these technologies together to get the best out for the people. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, please do visit uh, their stall here at Republica. Thank you very much, Annette. Thank you very much. Uh, so... Next up, we have uh, Thomas Handorf of uh, WebPager. The Swiping Interactive Web. Yeah. I'll leave you to it. Yeah, hi, I'm Thomas. I hope that the slides will show up in a second. this button in the right top corner. Right. 
Yeah, um, thanks again. I'm Thomas, uh, the CEO of WebPager. And let, where's the mouse? This is a web page, actually. And the question is, how do you present yourself, your product, or your idea in the web? Individual, stunning, and emotional, I would say. So how about this? This is a, a website for an, uh, for an artist. So it gets the visitor into the mood by just slowly following the mouse and zooming into parts of the website and revealing more and more details. Or if you want to tell a story, um, then you could use this approach with nice animations uh, like this space odyssey here. Or if you need a completely different perspective on something like the book Alice in Wonderland, uh, where the whole book is on a single web page, and you can zoom in into every uh, chapter to read it. So how about this for your blog? So do you think it's hard to do? Do you think you have to code or even need an agency to do this? I tell you no. All these pages have been done with WebPager. And WebPager allows you to create agency-style websites as easy as you would do with this pen and paper. So let me show you how to create a simple uh, website here on stage. So it runs in the browser. So you just drag over an image to WebPager and just drop it there. So we want to use it as a background image, so we move it in the background. Then we add some caption. Yeah, so we uh, just format it, we get it some name, let's call it Into the Wild for some reason, and done. So we can add another text box. Essentially everybody that knows how to use uh, PowerPoint or Photoshop can use WebPager to build websites. So now we have already a simple uh, landing page created. So let's make it a bit more fancy by adding an animation to the background. Done. So it's now moving slightly left and right in the background. And we give it even more twist by adding a view. That's a bluish rectangle you see here. And we rotate it a bit and place it here. And now we can navigate to this view. So these views are one of the central concepts at WebPager. It's a bit like Prezi if you know it. So uh, the views allow you to define where the user can navigate on the website. So do you think that will be expensive? Well, actually, for 10 euros a month, you can create your own portfolio website with WebPager, which includes the editor and the hosting. If you need it a bit more professional, then we have an agency package for 35 euros, um, which has, it gives you more plugins, which gives you SEO optimization, A-B testing, and access to your customer pages. And if you need someone that uh, should design your page, we offer packages for design starting at 600 euros. We are a team of three founders. That's me, Thomas, Falco, who is also in the audience, um, we are coming from science and we did a Google Summer of Code project together where we uh, built a graph visualization software, which is kind of the predecessor. And Yevgeny, who is also in the audience today, uh, is a designer at heart. So he has lots of experience in user interface design and uh, worked at the Israeli startup scene. So far to the quick introduction to WebPager. If you liked it, I invite you to our website, webpager.com and check out these sample pages. There are actually more than the one uh, the, the I showed you. Um, if you sign up for the beta right now, uh, you, have to be, you have the chance to actually be one of the first persons to actually try it out. We are in private beta right now and letting in people step by step. Yeah, one more thing I have for you. Um, if you are asking how this looks on mobile devices, I just show you. It's a bit more complicated here with a microphone at the same time. So one second. So let me get the mic back. Yeah, it's actually working and it's working better because you can swipe. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you very much.
So, Thomas, it looks very, very cool. Thanks. Um, but uh, one of the things I hate, or one of the things that, that I find quite disturbing is when somebody messes with the usual functionality of a computer. If somebody's computer scrolls a different way to mine, it's really... Yeah. So, I mean, th this is going to be a new type of, of browsing a single web page. Um, mm -hmm. How do people react to it when they're sort of faced with using it? Yeah, I mean, you are completely right. We are messing up a bit with the uh, user experience. Actually, we are doing a research project with Humboldt University on this, exactly to find out how they react and how they actually navigate through it, so how they get conceptual uh, idea of the web page. I mean, we have a lot of opportunity here, and uh, these effects that are essentially a bit like Prezi, or at least partly like Prezi, um, one has to use them with a bit of care. For example, using like slight rotations on one website and doing zooms on another website. If you use everything, of course, the user is just confused. But I think uh, when you browse through the websites on our site, you see that it really adds value. And it's also a bit playful. So let, it lets people stay longer on your website yeah? because it's nice and playful and uh, vivid. I mean, do, do you think that... Um the web in general is going to move in a direction that's more towards this more involved usability. Yeah, I think so. Um, we, we see the trend to web apps, and web apps have the, uh, the swiping natively. So what we do is we uh, take websites which are not so uh, programmatically, not so interactive, and make them actually a web app, but you don't see this web app. It's still a website which is for information, for entertainment, but you can swipe on this and interact very closely to it. Are there, are there not an awful lot of uh, people doing the same sort of thing, you know, saying where we can build the sort of next great sort of yeah. web page for cheap and easy? Interestingly not. I mean, there, this is a crowded market because there are so many offerings of web builders. But this concept, which is actually going farther than this, is, uh, is not seen. Uh, we haven't seen it. Um, so the biggest are certainly Wix and Squarespace. They, they do great sites, but they are also very simple because you are locked to a template. And there are a lot of uh, smaller builders for mobile-only websites, like Strikingly. It's also very nice, but it's uh, very limited on the other side. So we are really the Photoshop for the web, in, in a certain sense. Photoshop for the web. There is the uh, soundbite. Thank you. Uh, one, one last thing. Your, your, your payment plan has sort of hosting involved. Yeah. Can, can people use your websites and host them on their own Service at, at the moment, not. Um, we are thinking, of course, I mean, we have a bigger vision of somehow transforming the web. Um, maybe it's a bit bold, but uh, in the end, I think uh, if we really want to go in this way, we have to make it more open, and that would mean that in the end also it can be deployed somewhere. But at the moment, we start with, uh, with these pricing, with these plans, which means you create it on the site, and it will be hosted on the site, but it allows you also to continuously lose, uh, use the editor. It's not like you do it once and deploy it, but you can continuously update, and it's important. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Yeah, thanks a lot. And uh, uh, next up, we have uh, David Bonney, who will be talking to us about Atheist Choose, apparently. Um, by the way, when I'm checking my phone, I'm checking the time. I'm not just bored and looking at my emails. It's important to point out. Also, unfortunately, because we have so many talks and we're trying to fit everything in, uh, there probably won't be any time for uh, public Q&A, so I'm sorry about that. But I'm sure all of the speakers will uh, be around and you can ask them your own questions. So, uh, David, uh, take it away. Thank you. I don't know much about web pager, so... Great. Okay, my name is David, and I am the founder, or one of the founders of Atheist Shoes, which is a concept which begs the question, why? Um, that is an atheist shoe. It has no reason to exist, really. It's just very comfortable, and it has Ich bin Atheist written on the sole, which people seem to like. Um, there really is no reason for it to exist, except maybe that atheists with feet are growing exponentially, so it is a good business opportunity. <laughs> But that's not the why for why we started it. We started it just as a kind of joke. We wanted to create the life of Brian of shoes. A typical Berlin project, you know. 
And uh, we also kind of wanted to make atheism pretty because it's, uh, I don't feel aesthetically represented by Richard Dawkins and those kind of terribly fonted logos he has. We, we kind of thought, you know, doesn't atheism belong to the Bauhaus with all that geometry and lack of hyperbole, hyperbole and clean lines and that. So we built a whole brand around it. Um, our shoe is very clean. We have a big circular geometric Bauhaus logo, which is kind of the godless abyss of nothingness, and which kind of works for atheism. We've even had customers tattoo it into their legs. So the real reason, though, that we started Atheist as a business was because the internet told us to. We posted uh, a picture of me holding a shoe on Reddit one night in January 2012, and uh, we got then 700,000 page views overnight. I went to the front page of the internet and we got hundreds of emails asking me to make shoes as a business. So we quickly had to realize how do we upscale from our Berlin studio to kind of meaningful production. So with the help of Kickstarter and strategically placed shoulder kittens, we found a workshop in Portugal and we managed to start producing shoes, which we have since sold all over the world to like dapper gentlemen in London and New York and brave Saudi Arabian teenagers and uh, also young people and old people. That guy is 76 and he's from Texas and this is a very attractive young lady from Washington and the beautiful thing about our business is we have no demographic whatsoever. It's entirely an attitudinal uh, definition of an audience. We've also had the more intelligent of celebrities, as Tim Minchin on the left walking beside a Spice Girl, and that's Eddie Izzard. Um, but they say that when you put your business out into the real world, it changes. And I feel that we've only really come to understand, understood why we do it uh, when we had feedback from people. For example, this is a young man from Nebraska who used a conversation about atheist shoes to come out to his evangelical Christian mother. And they cried a lot, and then uh, she bought him shoes for his birthday. And uh, we also like to think we're bringing atheists together. These two people met because they were wearing atheist shoes on top of a mountain together. And uh, we hope they're going to get engaged. That's them actually in Salt Lake City running a pop-up shop on our behalf. I think when you have customers doing that for you, it's a good sign. Uh, there's lots of very postmodern, avant-garde, zeitgeisty things about the business. You know, we're long tail. We had absolutely no idea what we were doing before we started. But maybe most interesting is that we have zero marketing spend. Um, we've relied on other things to get us noticed. For example, we did a scientific experiment last year proving that USPS discriminate against atheist branded packages. We uh, sent an equal number of packages, some neutrally branded like pornography, others with atheist tape all over them to America. And they should have arrived at the same time, but the atheist ones took on average three days longer and were 10 times more likely to disappear. So this caused outrage in America and we ended up in Time and NPR, and lots of other places. Um, another thing we did is on April 1st, I came out as a Christian and uh, for 24 hours and that sold us an awful lot of shoes as well. Apparently I'd found God between the ties of the Crimean prosecutor general. No one seemed to recognize her, but um, ultimately, we're a good business and, and we don't have to spend marketing because our product is good. Uh, word of foot is perhaps our greatest uh, thing. Just a few words about the future. Uh, we're already looking after the next generation. Uh, we have atheist baby shoes for those who believe in mummy, daddy or booby. And uh, we're just beginning to play with a concept called empathy shoes. We've teamed up with the laser company across the courtyard from us. And uh, we reckon we can laser any image you want onto the sole of a shoe. So maybe it's Angela Merkel riding a pony, or uh, maybe, maybe it's your last will and testament, which we're going to get notarized, and you can uh, exchange them every two years as a good will should be exchanged. And we're also going to put lots of Bluetooth and technology into our shoes. But uh, if you'd like to try our shoes on, please come do so at the stand opposite there. Otherwise, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. So, first question. If I'm an agnostic, do I wear one of the two shoes? That's a good point, actually. Never thought of that. Uh, well, now you can have what I, we could, like, laser a picture of a little girl sitting on a fence on the sole of your <laughs> shoe if you wanted, maybe. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I was quite curious um, that you have customers in places where religious tolerability, if that's not a word, um, isn't necessarily renowned for being high. So, Saudi Arabia, and even worse, 
Texas. Yes. Um, <clears throat> these, these teenage girls in Saudi Arabia, I mean, are they not putting themselves at risk by they walking are. around wearing shoes saying, it, Ich bin atheist? It was incredibly brave of them. I remember the first time we sent a package to one of them in Saudi Arabia. Um, a friend of mine processed it. It was at Christmas, and we had no idea whether we'd put atheist packing tape on it. And we were, <laughs> we were so pleased when it arrived there, and she didn't get, like... Um, given a death sentence, so. Um, Do you think, um, on a sort of slightly more serious note, that, you know, atheists, atheism, if it becomes a thing, it becomes a a group of people who say, we're atheists, that it essentially becomes another kind of religion? No, not at all. I mean, the the definition of a religion is kind of suspense of critical thinking and faith and all that. But but I will say our ambition, unlike the Catholic Church, is to be obsolete. Uh, We we would love there to be no need for an atheist shoe company uh, 50 years from now. And I'm mildly optimistic that might be the case. Okay, well, uh, let's let's look at... um uh, it, it sounds very Berlin-y, it's very buzzy, it's very, you know, oh, we don't spend on marketing because we're cool on the internet. Is this something that's going to disappear in, in, in a year or two as people go to a different fad? It, I, I think the only reason it might, it's not been a fad yet. We've been going two years and people are still buying and, and the numbers are growing. Uh, what might happen is we ourselves might get more excited about creating something else. But uh, hence we're, we're experimenting with other shoe designs. We are shoemakers at the end of the day. So we're not going to see atheist hats or... Atheist no, we've, re- we've resisted that. We did almost make atheist vodka, but we could make like atheist life assurance or anything. You know? I, I like atheist vodka. That yeah. sounds good. Are they are they atheist shoes? These are atheist shoes. Let's have so, a look. There you Let's go. See the hill. Excellent stuff. Thank you. Um, good. Okay, let me just double check. Yes, I think that's time. Thank you very much, David. Um, and uh, next up, we have uh, Elton Rivas, who will be talking to us about crowdfunding in person, a uh, very interesting project, but before that I'm going to take a picture of everyone with their headphones on. That's too bright. That's too bright, never mind. Caught it. Everyone could take a picture of you taking a picture of them. Wow, that's like really meta. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Okay, Ellen, off you go. Okay. Hello. How many people here have, or how many people here know what crowdfunding is? There should be a lot of hands. Keep your hands up. How many people out of that group have contributed to at least one crowdfunding project? How many have contributed to five or more? There's only five or six hands left. I want to talk to you today about the power of crowdfunding and why it's important to connect with people. Ironically, we all have headphones on. We could be talking in person today. I didn't plan it that way, but that helps with my point. My background, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've started a number of different businesses, uh, raised tens of millions of dollars in the States, um, working here in Berlin. And I want to talk to you a little bit about this festival that we started called OneSpark, which is the world's crowdfunding festival. The major point that I want you to take away today, and we can argue this, we can debate it, let's tweet at each other about it, but I believe that crowdfunding is ultimately the democratization of capital, and it has one of the single biggest powers to disrupt the traditional financial institutions that we'll see in our lifetimes. But there's a problem. We're starting to forget about the people and about the connections that we have directly in person in breaking through this digital noise that we all live in today. So here's the problem. We've gone from spending hours writing letters to each other through the post office and taking time to craft a very carefully orchestrated message that actually has significant meaning. And today we outsource that to virtual assistants that send an email on our behalf to this. Everyone in here has a smartphone. Everyone in here is well connected. We're listening to each other via digital microphones and headphones. The first organization of crowdfunding was way back in ancient times. Crowdfunding started actually as grain exchanges with Egyptian times where you began and you traded wheat for other services. You traded those things in grain houses. So we've gone from that 
to this, where everything again is in this digital environment. And that's great. Technology is an enabler of all of these translations, of all of these types of pathways for different people. But crowdfunding itself, crowdfunding has the power to be ultimately one of the most disruptive forces, as I've said, in the financial markets and institutions because it allows people to direct their money exactly where they want it to go. It passes through all of the other uh, institutional vehicles, all of the financial instruments, and allows for people to put their money where they want to see things happen. The key point, though, it's very hard if I'm going and I'm asking him a question about his crowdfunding project, if he does that online. How many of you that have contributed to those crowdfunding projects have had more than one interaction with that person? There's five hands in the room, the whole room, that's it. So online is great. It's a very good mechanism for us to interact and for us to scale these projects. But people always invest in people. First and foremost, before anything else, especially in a very early stage cycle of a project, of a startup, of an artist, of a musician, of these types of creative community people that are building the things that we all want to see, that are all part of this room. And crowdfunding should be open to all. It should be open to all people that have access to it, whether that's a family that doesn't know how to get online to platforms like Start Next or others that are out there, that doesn't have the skill set with technology, but they want to invest in people. They want to contribute to their project because they believe in it, they're passionate about it, they disagree with it, so they contribute to somebody else, but they do that because they invest in people and it should be open to all. So we started this crowdfunding festival and in our second year in the States, we had 260,000 people show up. They voted to distribute over $300,000 to almost 600 different startups or projects in person. If you were to take crowdfunding and spill it into a city and allow people to directly interact with each other again and ask them why they're doing their projects, that's what we did. By the way, it had a huge online impact. We had almost 100 million impressions in just a five-day period of time. This was in our second year. I think we're on to something here. We are going to be talking about OneSpark and about OneSpark Europe and OneSpark Berlin tomorrow afternoon at the New Thinking booth. Uh, from 11 until 3 in the afternoon. So I encourage you, if you're curious about in-person crowdfunding, feel free to come meet our team that's here. Uh, meet the team that's here from the States as well. And we'll see you then. Thank you. Good stuff. All right. Well, uh, tell us very, very briefly, uh, OneSpark Berlin, the first one outside of the U.S., uh, when and where? The 12th through 14th at the Alta Munza. And uh, how much? Oh, September. How much do tickets cost? Tickets for the public are free. Trick question, there we <laughs> go. Ah. Um, good, okay, well, obviously it's been a huge hit in, in the US, yeah. a lot of people coming in, um, but how much is that really an effect of, it's a good time, we can go there, we can vote to give someone else's money to one of these cool projects, they go home, they forget about it. Yeah, the, I, I think the beauty of One Spark is that it's a fair meets a festival, and it's, it's almost a party with a purpose, right? So people go there, and if half the people go there because they have a purpose that they're interested in these ideas, they see projects like we've just seen here uh, over the past few talkers and will continue to see. Um, and so they go, they attend, they get to vote. They get to contribute directly there in real time to these projects as well. And then on top of that, it's a good time. So, you know, you can go for the festival and you can go and actually help these projects get off the ground. But are, are the people who go to the festival and have a good time, are they likely then to go home and become crowdfunding uh, funders, crowdfunders? Yeah, we, we've seen a lot of that. And we've also seen a lot of the projects that start with OneSpark then translate and launch their own projects because they've had real-time market validation over that five days. Here it'll be over those three days. And the feedback that they get tunes their pitch. I mean, if you have a pitch 500 times a day and you're talking to all these people, and then the beauty of it is that it starts to connect all these communities. So you get 
arts connected with tech, you get science and health connected with people in music, and new, new innovative ideas start to breed from that, and they carry that forward year round. And the people that just attend for the party get exposure to crowdfunding, and they get to do it in a very simple personal setting, rather than having to break through that noise of, oh, I don't know this project, I don't trust this project online, I don't know these people, and, and you can do that in person. Now, obviously, like like you said, it's been very successful in Jacksonville and in Florida. You've had the mayor involved. It's been awesome. Yeah. Um, other big events in the U.S. have, have come to Berlin. Uh, TechCrunch Disrupt is the most obvious one. Do you think that you can transfer the same, uh, the same feeling, the same buzz, the same interest um, into a city which is a little bit more cynical? <laughs> Jacksonville is a very cynical city. Um, I think that that Berlin and I've. You know, this is only my, my fifth time here. I'll be spending two weeks this time. Uh, we have great partners that are on the ground here that know the city very well and have, have been here for years and were born here. Uh, but what we love about Berlin is the creativity, the culture, the people. Uh, and I think that, that OneSpark is really just a platform for these people to participate in and make it their own. So, you know, we're not expecting 250,000 people in the first year. We're, we're scaling it down. I mean, Ultimunza can't hold that many people. Uh, but it's a good starting point and we'll build on quality. Just very quickly then, tell me your uh, favorite project that got funded at OneSpark. We, we have made it a point to stay away from picking favorites for, for different projects. Um, there's one project, there's actually, I'll, I'll talk about, that was a, just a simple chair. And they did that in the first year. Uh, the second year they got uh, venture funding. They went through an accelerator program and they actually just received two container full orders of their chair from uh, somebody here in Germany. So talk about a, a connection of different things. Uh, that's a really good connection. It must be quite a nice chair. Yeah, it's, it's a great chair. <laughs> Thank you very much, Elton. And please, um, like he said, they'll be there tomorrow afternoon uh, across the way. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, next up, we have uh, Carla Kiermis talking about the Startup Chile program. As soon as we're ready to go. Startup South American style. Good stuff. Off you go. Hello, my name is Carla Kirmes. I'm trade advisor at the Chilean Embassy, and I'm here to talk with you about the entrepreneurial revolution going on in Chile right now. Did you know that Chile is right about to become a developed country? We believe that entrepreneurship is the shortcut to achieve this development goal. And in this context, the Chilean government uh, developed a program which is called Startup Chile, and I'm here to talk about this. The Startup Chile program uh, was created on behalf of the Chilean government and seeks to attract early stage companies to use uh, uh, Chile as a platform to start their business and to go global from Chile on. Our mission is to transform Chile, our country, into the leading entrepreneurial hub in Latin America. And so far we are doing quite well. So how do we attract you, the entrepreneurs? First of all, we give you a one-year working visa. The program only lasts six months, but if you want to, you can stay longer. And the second point now is maybe the most important thing for you. We give you $40,000 non-equity seed capital, which will be there for, for your project and for your living there. You will have a soft lending and hospitality program provided by your godfather, Padrino. Uh, he will uh, guide you during the first steps in Chile and help you um, finding, for example, a place to live, uh, giving you the access to uh, networking opportunities and to the Latin American market. And of course, you will experience our culture, which is really special, and our language. I mean, it's Spanish, but it doesn't sound like the typical Spanish of South America. You will experience it. And the really nice thing is that you will have the opportunity to be part of a history-making process by introducing a cultural shift into the Chilean community. So, you might ask yourself, why do we do this and what do we expect from you? First of all, commitment. We really wa want all the entrepreneurs to engage in social impact activities and showing the Chileans that it is possible to be an entrepreneur. 
because you have to motivate them, you have to teach them, you can share your experiences. There's so many ways to do this. So far there have been more than 700 hours of mentoring, uh, sorry, 700 meetups for example. There have been thousands of workshops and what is really important for us is that you go, um, go out of Santiago capital, go to the regions, it's a really long and, and thin uh, country which is more than 4,000 kilometers long. So you might imagine yourself that outside of Santiago there's a whole world to explore. And so far there have been more than 150,000 attendees uh, to these activities. As you will be really um, far away from home, at least you're from South America, I don't know, um, the most important thing will be the tribe, our family. Uh, we are really proud of our diversity. As you might see, we had, um, we had applicants from every continent representing more than 65 uh, countries. And so far we had in our program uh, during the last three years more than 750 startups. So, what might be the most interesting thing for you? The economic numbers. Um, about 100 startups raised uh, so far more than 50 million dollars funds. Uh, eight companies have been acquired and we created more than 1,000 jobs. This is really good and Startup Chile, the organization, is really concerned about you to maximize your success in Chile. There's a lot of recognition our program um, achieved so far, but what is really important for us uh, as a government is that we, um, we achieved a, a reinvention of the local media. Imagine that a few years ago there was no special section about entrepreneurship or innovation in the major newspapers. Now it is, and this is really important because more and more Chileans are reading about innovation. So, the media, um, the press coverage um, numbers show this um, as well. And four, four years ago, for example, there were only 19 international articles about Chile um, talking about innovation or entrepreneurship. During the last year, there have been more than 1,000, including really nice articles about Silicon Valley <laughs> um, in, the, in, in The Economist, El País and uh, Huffington Post. This makes us really proud and um, shows us that we're doing good. So, what are you waiting for? Apply now. The next application process will be open in June. The exact date you can look up in at startupchile.org. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carla. How was um, my time? Perfect. perfect. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> um, so, I've not had the pleasure of going to Chile, but I have had friends who have. Really? I've, I've just heard wonderful things about it. And did they participate in the program or no, they went not, on journey? They're not entrepreneurs, okay. so they're not that good friends, you know. Okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, a wonderful country, I'm sure, but why, why is it a good place to go and do a startup? Why not stay here? Why not stay here? Because you can find in Chile a ecosystem which is really young. You have so many opportunities and so much potential to, uh, to get access to, which here in Berlin, for example, it is so difficult because there's so many startups that you won't see uh, the tree in, 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 the, in the wood, as they say in German. So in Chile you have a platform where you are not one of millions, but one of thousands. So you have much more opportunities. And you have the um, opportunity to go to the neighbor countries. Because as you know, in South America, almost all of them speak Spanish, unless uh, Brazil. So uh, we are really connected in between of us. Um, but, you know, a lot of startups in Berlin, for example, have uh, found difficulties with um, growing beyond that first stage because they found difficulty to go global from Berlin. Mm -hmm. um, and Berlin's in the middle of Europe. I mean, it's not English speaking, but if it's difficult in Berlin, Surely, um, it's no easier, should we say, in, in Chile to go global from somewhere like Chile. It always depends on your project. So, we live in an internet world, as we just said, so it doesn't matter where you are. You have to have you a big and a really good project, a good business plan, you have to have the connections. And maybe we, uh, on behalf of our program, have the possibility to give you an access to a really big and... Um, um, high quality networking um, opportunities which you won't have here. You really have a person there who helps you. You can go there, you, you can ask him, hey, I need, I don't know, a VC, I, don't, I need a list of angels, please give, uh, help me and he will give you because you have there your godfather. 
And this is the Godfather we're talking about. Um, uh, for example, but for example, um, for uh, the thing is that all the startups who uh, take uh, to, who participate in the program, they will all be at the same co-working space, yeah. the Glass House in Santiago. So imagine, imagine the the um, the energy which creates this place. You have so many possibilities. It's not like here in Berlin where you have, you, you have plenty of co-working spaces. You don't even know where to go. Um, there is one, and there is all concentrated. So it's really much easier to find what you need. Is there, uh, is there a lot of uh, investment? Is there a lot of VCs? Is there yes. a lot of angel investment yeah. and, in Chile? And all this scene is growing every year. As you just saw, we, we, um, we started only four years ago. So this is a really young program and um, we are growing every year. And uh, with us, the VCs. So uh, there is fund, funding opportunity and possibilities. What happens if you, uh, you, you go to Chile, you start your startup, and uh, it grows very well and in a couple of years time you're looking for series A, series B. Is this later level of funding also available? Uh, we don't know that yet because we're now at the 10th generation in the third year of generations because we started planning it four years ago but we, uh, we are now in the 10th generation and we, we didn't see this uh, development yet. Maybe in one year I can tell you more but at this moment it's a little bit difficult to uh, evaluate this point. And um, let me just uh, double check the the, the forty thousand dollars right yes. that you get non equity non equity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but what what do you have to give in return for the forty thousand? It's only the social impact activities. Uh, there's a return value agenda um, where we can measure what you are doing for the chilling community. So um, there you you can notice all your um, hours of mentoring, workshops at universities, at institutes, whatever you want. It can be really. Um, it depends on you on on your your own. Quality qualification, your education, it depends 100% on you. And, and why, um, why are the, the, the locals um, less keen to, to become entrepreneurs? What, what is it? Uh, you have to know that Chile, um, um, until now, is depending much on the mining sector. So um, this is a really huge uh, economic sector uh, where you don't have so much possibilities to uh, to, to get into it. So um, and it, it, it uh, um, and it has a lot of money. So most people it goes to the university to study something um, just for to, just to work there. So there is not this incentive to start your own business because you, then the most logical thing is to go to the mining sector for example but there are many there are plenty more sectors of uh, industry in Chile so um, what we are trying to introduce to our community is this entrepreneurial um, spirit that's something w what doesn't exist yet but uh, every more uh, every with every generation there are more and more Chileans applying to the program what what is a really good sign for us thank you very much Carla you're welcome And uh, last but by no means least is uh, AJ Moyur, there he is, uh, talking to us about uh, a marketplace of uh, professional workshops. There we go. I quite like Chilicon Valley actually, that's, <laughs> that's made me quite happy. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, off you go. Hi, my name is AJ. I'm from the Netherlands, Holland. Um, Frismakers is a, a Dutch name. It means uh, making fresh. And in 2008, I started together with Susanne, my business partner, I started Frismakers in the Netherlands. Uh, what we do actually is we organize workshop events for people who are innovative in the Netherlands, for big companies like Philips or DSM. Uh, and they, they pitch to each other, they share their knowledge. Uh, we did that a couple of years in a very, well, quite traditional way. We hired a location, just like here. We um, arranged the speakers. We said to those speakers, please uh, send us your sheets, and then we're going to have a look at it, and we, we, we're going to have a briefing, and we help you. But um, actually, in the, in, the, in the last year, uh, we discovered that um, there are actually too many meetups, uh, webinars, uh, conferences, festivals, there's too much. I mean, in the Netherlands, there is. I can go to a workshop or to a meeting uh, maybe uh, five times uh, per week uh, because there's too much. So actually, then we said that traditional way of, 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 of organizing workshops like everyone else is doing, should we continue or should we change our strategy? And, um, and actually, um, that's what I'm going to tell you about now. 
um, what we're doing. I think everyone knows Booking.com. Is there someone who doesn't know Booking.com? There's one hand over there. <laughs> um, you can book a hotel here. Um, and um, it's, uh, it started uh, in 1997 in the Netherlands by a Dutch entrepreneur. And they now have 400,000 bookings per day. They charge 15 euros for those per booking to the hotel. So they earn 6 million euros or dollars a day. It's huge. Um, and they, then if you take a look at booking.com, it's actually, it's, it's bringing the traditional world of hotels to a website, to bringing it online. But um, that's cool. But I mean, me as a, my personal favor is actually Airbnb. Who doesn't know Airbnb in, in this room? I think also 95%. What is so nice about Airbnb compared to Booking.com? If I book a room in a hotel, I come to a desk and I still have someone who is doing that for a job. I'm still having someone who is in a professional way providing me uh, an anonymous room. And it's great. I mean, if I go to Berlin and I book a hotel, I'm having a great time. But I'm still in that, in that yeah, anonymous um, room. If I uh, book a room at Airbnb, then I met a local person uh, living in his house, in his room, uh, who can tell me a lot about, uh, for example, now Berlin, who can tell me the nice spots, etc. Uh, and there's a big difference between Booking.com and Airbnb. And that's actually, that's that button over there. That button makes it possible for everyone in the world to upload your own room. Actually, it's um, the entrance for a whole community. Actually, what, that's what we're doing right now in the Netherlands. We are saying we still organize our own meetings, our own workshops, pitches, etc. But now we're offering everyone who has their own meeting, their own workshop, we're offering them to upload it uh, at our website. Because in this way, we already we, we believed it five years ago, but, we, but, but, but it became more clear. Everyone is an expert. Everyone has to offer something, some knowledge, expertise that they can learn to each other. Um, so actually start sharing. That's, that's what we're doing right now. And in the Netherlands, uh, we're quite making progress. In Germany, we started Frismakers a year ago. And we're still searching for people who want to bring the, the community of workshops, who want to bring that here also uh, further. So if you want to speak about that and want to know how, uh, just please come to me. Thank you very much. Don't need that anymore. Um, okay, so I've gone to your website. Um, I want to share a workshop that I'm doing um, and it's on open heart surgery. Um, now, I don't know anything about open heart surgery, but I'm going to charge people to come to my workshop. A roundabout way of saying, how do you do quality control? Um, first of all, um, actually, we really looked a lot to our Airbnb, how they do it. Um, actually, we know how to organize workshops. We know how to make the quality at the level which is needed. So we do small things to get sure that, uh, that the quality will be there. For example, what we do is we ask you to make a nice profile of yourself, to add your showcases that you really did, heart surgery um, operations, so that people start believing you that you're really an expert. That's, that's one. Secondly, what we do is we contact you and we verify some things. Did you really work at that company? You, you, you gave up, things like that. And thirdly, it's possible that we help you with the moderation if you are... If you're not an experienced workshop uh, supplier, then we can help you and we can help you moderate. This sounds very labor intensive. I mean, for a platform which is kind of, or it, it should be quite hands off. You know, you want to do a workshop, you do it, it's done, we take a cut. I mean, how are you going to expand this to become as big as Airbnb? It was very, very, very labor uh, intensive. So what we did, we phoned people, people came to our offices and we discussed the whole the setup of the workshop. And now we're do making it automatically, we're processing and making it automatically in such a way that, it, that it's less and less labor intensive. But it still is. But in the end, yes, we would like to, 
to say, okay, it happens all online. So I booked my room at Airbnb here in Berlin. There's no one who I need to contact. Everything is done online. I can chat with the one who is, is offering the room. That kind of stuff we are incorporating in the website also. So tell us a little bit uh, about your business model. Are you, are you sort of, are people going to charge for their workshops and you, you take a slice of that or how, how is it yeah, going to work? People can indicate uh, uh, what price they want to, uh, uh, for a ticket fee. Sometimes uh, there are uh, people who say, I don't want to charge a price, it's for free. Um, uh, we charge uh, a commission and uh, if it's for free, we charge uh, a little uh, um, uh, um, fixed amount. Uh, sometimes uh, a big company says, I would like to sponsor it. So we sometimes also find sponsors. So, so it depends. Yeah. How do you, I mean, I, I, can, I can appreciate that finding people willing to do workshops is probably fairly simple, but how do you reach uh, a large enough audience to provide people for each of these workshops? Uh, yeah, that's actually in our, in our uh, background uh, system. We just know, we work with, we call it topics. So you have themes, categories, topics, but we, we call it very specific topics. So for example, startups is a topic. So we know if someone really likes, uh, is interested in startups, he only gets to see startup uh, uh, workshops. And also the search-based website, which is actually booking.com or Airbnb is doing that as well. If I type in Berlin, then it, I, I only get rooms in Berlin. So actually we really made the comparison of booking a room instead of with uh, booking a workshop. And uh, let's hope you don't get banned in Berlin like Airbnb. Yeah. Um, so let me change tack slightly. Um, being in a native English speaker who lives in Germany, speaks German reasonably well, um, I always sort of look at startups, German-founded startups with German names, and I always think, aha, you're going to regret that. So as you're now going international, are you regretting having a Dutch name, which whilst not being complicated, it doesn't, it doesn't strike me because I don't speak Dutch. I, I didn't get, oh, fresh makers. Uh, is this something you're regretting now? Um, yes and no. What we do is we do everything in the local language. So we didn't start with English right away in the Netherlands. And Dutch people like to speak English. So we said, no, just do it in local language. Also with uh, the guys we're uh, organizing, Frismakers here, they said, please, let's do it in German. And, um, and they said, let's use the name Frismakers. But you're right. You're right. Um, if we're not in the process, may, there may come a new name. You're right. Yeah. Us, uh, us native English speakers are quite selfish when it comes to language. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, AJ. Appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much, everyone, for staying and watching. Uh, before you go, let me just uh, tell you uh, that Silicon Alley, we're going to have a meetup with the Global Innovation Gathering guys, innovators from all over the world. It's this afternoon at 3 o'clock, and it's out by the old bus just where you come in off the street. So please join us for that. Um, and the Berlin Web Week closing party at Friday night, 9 o'clock. Um, it's on our website. Thank you very much.